When I was young, I was sure I was going to be a pro basketball player, win multiple championships, then get inducted into the Hall of Fame. Norm Bass, he was a far better athlete than me, and he must have thought the same things as a kid. Turns out, he did make the Hall of Fame, just not for the sport he might have imagined. I'm a Venice, California-born, Los Angeles-based sports fan. One that has played, coached, announced, and promoted sports my whole life. My love affair with sports started in my own backyard and has led me to this podcast. Thanks to the support of the Amateur Athletic Union in East Bay, I'm excited to bring you Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. Hello, sports historians. Welcome to audio, video, podcast, episode number 38 of Sports Stories with Denny Lennon, the final of our four-part series on the incredible life of Norm Bass. If you've missed parts one, two, or three, you of course can watch or listen the link on our website, sportsstoriespodcast.com. The Hall of Fame Norm was inducted into, not baseball or football, but ping pong. Yep, that's right. Norm Bass, the former Kansas City A's pitcher and Denver Broncos defensive back, ended up in the U.S. Table Tennis Hall of Fame. I'm sure he was inducted for both his accomplishments as a player and his contributions as a woofer. Before we go much further, we need to say hello to the producer of the top video podcast in the Sentinel Adobe Corridor, the director of the SSDL5 slate of shows on YouTube, and the woman recently nominated for a coveted YouTube Graphite Award as a video podcast producer for her work on the SSDL three-part Wayne Bowley series, my QP for life, Christine Jimbo. Hi, everybody. Nice to know I'm in the running for a graphite. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Good to know. It's, it's important. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm here to remind you uh, that we have an East Bay store opening. Mm-hmm. And if you want more information, email info at sportsstoriespodcast.com to find out more about that. Find us and follow us on social media. You can find us by searching Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. That's Denny like the restaurant, Lennon like the Beatle. Go to our website, sportsstoriespodcast.com, and find all of our links to subscribe, like, and all that other stuff. Great. I uh, also want to let everybody know we're going to start to distribute uh, some of our shows, including our Wednesday High School to Olympians uh, show on The High School Narrative. It's an OTT app. I know. Kind of sounds legit. We, of course, will keep everything updated on our website. Also, consider following me on Twitter at Sports Stories DL. After a struggle with severe rheumatoid arthritis, Norm Bass found redemption, and he also found table tennis. His rise in the sport was dramatic, but as we've learned, Norm, while maybe not a Runyon-esque character, is certainly a character, more like a Forrest Gumpian figure that boggles the mind. Did you know that Norm met President Clinton? You will not believe what he asked him. But, as I've said before, these stories are much better told by Norm. So let's get to part four, the final installment of our series before we do. Again, recognizing Norm's son, Norman Delaney Bass III, author of the book Color Him Father, an American journey of hope and redemption. And of course, we want to recognize again the coffee company and Gus and his family for allowing us to interview Norm at his favorite restaurant there in Westchester, California. We would enjoy doing more video podcasts from that location. So now it's time from the coffee company in Westchester, California, where Norm's USA Table Tennis Hall of Fame plaque sits proudly above his favorite table. Here's part four of our interview with the one and only Norm Bass. Please note this interview was recorded on February 27th, 2020. You went to um, McDonald Douglas, worked for McDonald Douglas in Culver City? Culver City. It was a friend of mine who worked in personnel. And he asked me, what was I going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, why don't you come out here and let's sit down and maybe there's something out here you might want to do. So I went out there and he showed me the machine room where they had computers and great big old t- magnetic tapes. And mm-hmm. the guys walking around with pipes in their mouth, sweaters on, slacks. I said, that's me right there. 
<laughs> so uh, that's how I got in the machine room. It's, okay, so that's uh, July of 65, and, and, and that's when you joined a, McDonald's. I uh, joined as a computer operator. A computer operator in 65. And that was the guy who ran the printers and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, what, as this started, these years started to pile up, I would imagine you really missed competing. Well, what had happened was that uh, that's when I found table tennis. Mm-hmm. I found table tennis after about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I said, I wonder, can I play that? Okay. So I go in there, and they got these different kind of paddles. They got all kind of rubber. They got all kind of rules. I don't even know the rules. This is at um, Rogers Park? Rogers Park. Yeah. So I tried to play with a conventional paddle, but it was too heavy for my strength that I had at the time. Mm. I had to take a Motrin to play every time I played. And and, and did you have to grip the paddle in a different way because of your uh well i had to hold it RA? in such a way and, and i couldn't hit a, a conventional stroke i had to push the ball i see and i had to play defense so that so, but the paddle was too heavy okay so then i picked up another paddle and it felt just right that was called a hard bat mm. no sponge it's just rubber on the wood mm -hmm. and i started using that and i got that down where i'm pitching again i'm changing speeds <laughs> I'm, uh -huh. I'm hitting it hard. I'm hitting it soft. I'm moving it. So then I got excited. Now, and all of a sudden, my whole thing was fulfilled through table tennis. Um, I find this interesting. They talk, so, so this Rogers Park, it was like it was the, the hub of people that were playing table tennis. And, and somebody says in, in the book, they say, um, the strange thing about Norm is that he's able to take the skill he developed in the professional word, world, coordinate it, with table tennis play, and then bring in a different personality. We never had a person, go figure, we never had a personality like Norman before in table tennis. Before, everyone was tremendously serious. No jokes on the sideline or anything because the concentration was as intense as it could be. The concentration was that serious. Norman came in and in his own way broke up that seriousness. Everybody started enjoying playing table tennis with a lot of camaraderie and joke about a good shot. You could intimidate another player, but in a fun way. So they you, they so wouldn't you even this clear their throat up in there. It was so <laughs> quiet that you clear your throat up, somebody going to cuss you out. Because you're supposed to be quiet. They wanted to hear the ball hit the table. They wouldn't speak. They wanted to fight. And so I didn't know the rules. I come in there talking, like always. And they said, man, you can't talk. I said, where are the rules at? What the rules say you can't talk? And I'm talking, and then finally they started getting into that. Then they started having fun. But it was a morgue in there, man. Thirty guys sitting around the room in there, nobody said a word. Oh, man. How uh, you going to have fun with that? You're not. Uh, and they were so serious about the rubbers and the, about somebody call a bad call. And I didn't care about that. I went down there every week and took my whipping for about a month. For about a month. <laughs> then when I saw what they was doing, I said, now nah, I got to get the ball down lower over the net, and I got to push it around, and I got to stay out of the guy's strength unless I want him to hit it. And okay. I started thinking like a pitcher. Okay. And then I started beating them guys on just knowledge. So like a pitcher, location, right. change of speed. And a pitcher, I don't care how old he is, he can remember what a guy hit when he was eight. <laughs> If, if you can't remember that, then you're not a good pitcher. So you're remembering each of these players, their tendencies. Well, this guy was hitting topspin. Mm -hmm. And topspin is a dangerous shot. And they were just coming into table tennis then. Mm -hmm. This one guy could hit it this way with topspin, and he could hit it this way. Mm -hmm. But when he hit the topspin, his arm is way over here. And I say, if I push that thing over here, he can't get his arm back. Mm -hmm. So I started making him hit like this because he, <laughs> mm -hmm. he couldn't get his arm back. So I started moving the ball around, and I started hitting the corner of the tables a lot. And they called me Mr. Chips. <laughs> and that's how I got the name. Because <laughs> I would chip the edge so, and chip the edge. They didn't like that. that. Was that Sidney Poitier played him? And yeah. I did it yeah. consistently. Okay. And so I changed all of that. Um, so, 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 Norm, obviously, uh, what was the process of going from, like, playing at Rogers Park it, what, what, did they have tournaments that you could then, like, Well, they in-house tournaments, but what, what happened, they got tournaments all over Southern California. Mar Vista was one of them. Sure. That was the first tournament I played in. They took, they took me up there to play in a tournament. I never played. Hmm. And when you play in a tournament, I didn't even have a rank. They got rankings. Mm -hmm. And they have to watch you play, and they give you a ranking when mm -hmm. you start. So I played in the tournament. I went through that group so fast. I'm sitting down waiting on the other bracket <laughs> for the guy to get to the end. 
And I waited about an hour. I had beat them guys to death. They couldn't deal with that little stuff, that little soft stuff and all that. And I beat them, and I won, won the tournament just on the first one. <laughs> and then when I went down to Laguna, I played in the tournament, and I had they, they matched me up with a German, with a, a Russian junior champ. Oh, wow. I take him to the wire. Okay. And then they gave me a rating when that was over. They gave me a rating. Uh, if you are rated over 2,000, that's – Elite tennis, table tennis. Okay. My first rating was 2015. Wow. Most people get 1,500, 1,600. So that identifies you so that, so that whoever is running our United States table tennis program, all of a sudden you're identified, and then subsequently on some level you're, you're classified as a Category 7 as it relates to the well, Paralympic a, Games. A, is a that category right? Category 7 has to do with Paralympics. Mm-hmm. Category seven is depends on your disability. Mm -hmm. You got to have something wrong with the top part of your body as well as the bottom to be a seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are rated that way. But this other rating is for able-bodied table tennis players, and uh, you can't play nobody lower than you by the I rating. See. Not unlike getting a handicap in golf or something along these lines, but table tennis, obviously being an Olympic sport. It's much more precise. But a, but a person who has a disability, he has to play able-bodied players in tournaments. They don't have no special thing for you. You got to pay them. How do you make a? How do you make like the national team and then move towards qualifying for the Paralympic Games? You how have to go out of the country at mm -hmm. least one time. Okay. And you have to get to the, at least to the quarterfinals, and you got to you got to beat somebody. Mm. And they give you a rating, and they take twelve guys to the Olympics and that kind of thing. And you have to be in that group. Where'd you go? Uh, that's when I went to Australia. I was ranked number oh. five. Wow. Now, how did you get that? How did you get that high of a? Uh, I beat some guys that was better than me and had higher <laughs> ranks. I beat the butt. <laughs> <laughs> did, did did any of these guys like were they upset about the, your style? Oh, they of play? wouldn't shake my hand. They get mad. Like your style of play? Did that they, tick they them get off? mad? They walk <laughs> off. I, did, I got seven chips in a row with a guy. Hit the net. Brr, brr, and the guy got mad and threw the ball at me. 100 miles an hour, he threw the ball, and I moved to here. And we got a, there's a judge and a referee sitting right there. They don't say nothing to the guy. Wow. I called time. I said, hey, man, you see what this guy just did? Aren't you going to tell him something? And they get the judge and referee didn't say nothing because, you know, we are Americans. And Americans get the wrong end of everything when you go out the country. <laughs> sure. So they said uh, he didn't say anything. I said, well, let, excuse me for a minute. I walked around the table. I told that dude, I said, hey, man. You hit another ball like that. You fool around and hit me with the ball. I'm better at this now. I'm going to beat your butt. <laughs> yeah. So when I beat him, he walked off the table and walked all the way around the venue and wouldn't shake my hand. Oh, man. I followed him <laughs> all the way around until he sit down over here and made him do it. I said, come on now. Give it up. <laughs> made him do it. Made him do it. <laughs> oh, man. We interrupt this podcast to bring you a commercial. Sport Stories with Denny Lennon aims to bring its subscribers interesting, unique, and uplifting stories. You can find us at sportstoriespodcast.com. We drop audio, video podcasts every Thursday and go live at 5 on YouTube four nights a week. That's Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. And now back to our interview. So you qualify for Sydney Olympics. For the That's how so, I qualify. So, so uh, for those that don't know, the Paralympics are married very closely to the Olympic Games. I mean, they either they, take place before or after. They play every place the Olympics plays, but they play like two weeks after they finish. Mm -hmm. We have bigger crowds. We had 100,000 people at the opening ceremony. Wow. wow. And then, you know, in the, in the United States, you'd be lucky to get 20 people to watch a table tennis match. Now, that's, that's got to be exciting. Um, I understand... Um, I think Claudia, who we both know, for, I know from the YMCA, you've known her for years. Um, she hosted a, a going away party at her house before you took off for Sydney. Is that right? Yep. 
Yep, and that must have been fun, and that must have made you proud to be wearing, you know, the uh, well, official gear. And all of them was there at the thing. Rosie. Uh, Rosie Greer. Uh, Ollie Matson was there. Lou Johnson. All them guys, because I know all them guys. They were there. And they're uh, and, and, and they, they gotta be they gotta be tripping out on you. What you're 61 <laughs> at the time. Well, 61, that was yeah. almost unheard of, man. You're, you're, you're like 60. You're going to be playing all these younger younger guys. 18, 19, and I'm whipping their butt, man. And, and, and you're about to take off for Sydney. Did you um, – I would imagine you're a confident athlete. You probably didn't get nervous much. Did this make you nervous? No. No? No. I, I wanted to know could I beat these guys. Uh -huh. I wanted to know. I didn't, it wasn't that he was too good and I was going to panic. It wasn't that. I was never, I, I was never afraid of the challenge. Uh -huh. I played the number one player from Germany. Couldn't know the United States player beat this guy at the time. And this is in Sydney. This is in Sydney. Uh -huh. He got the camera set up over there, filming the match because he just figured he could send that back to Germany, and, it, and he was going to whip me right quick. Uh -huh. He won the first game. I win the second one. Uh -huh. Now we got to go three. I said, I bet you'll take those cameras now. Now, won't you? <laughs> so he took the cameras down. And I'm chopping the ball, and this guy's crying trying to hit it back. <laughs> He's the number one player in the world. He's crying. He couldn't hit the chop because nobody chopped. I was the first one to bring the chop to the game. You know, I lean back on your fastball. I can catch it, and I chop it. And the English comes back this way. And when they hit the table, you try to push it, they go down in the table. I was doing that to these guys. So the German was the number one ranked guy? Yeah. And you took him out. He wanted me to move to Germany. <laughs> he wanted he, me to be in said, their, on their club. Das Sprechen der Deutsch. And then when I be walking around in China alone, I don't even know these people. They be walking around imitating my chop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. So to take me through the tournament in, in Sydney. You beat the German in the in, – in the, uh, is it is it single elimination bracket players? No, I didn't beat him. I beat him a game, but we couldn't beat him. But he we had to go three. So is it pool, is it pool play followed by bracket play? How did, how did the Olympic games Well, work? the Olympic games is this way. you got to play one doubles and mm -hmm. the rest of them singles. you got mm -hmm. to win three games in order to advance. Mm -hmm. and me and my buddy had to play two singles and a double. Mm -hmm. Now, the Germans had the, the best doubles team in the world. Mm-hmm. And me and him never played together, but we was on the team because we had to make up something. We beat them in, in double. We beat the number one team. Wow. But we couldn't beat them in single. Okay. And so how did you get into bracket play? Or, I mean, how did you get into metal play? With the, well, that's when I got to bronze. Yeah. We, we had to beat this team to win that, and mm. we beat another team. We beat Switzerland. And, and when, once you beat Switzerland, you knew you had secured the bronze? Well, it was for the bronze. It was for the bronze. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that must uh, have been a, a, a pretty good feeling, huh, knowing you're getting Well, that's when my brother showed up. Yeah. Dick came. I had a sponsor then that sponsored all my clothes and money and everything. Uh, yeah. And this guy bought a ticket, a round-trip ticket for, for Dick, for Norman, and for Purvis. Wow. Who and did I didn't know this. Who did that for you? What was his name? Uh, and he went to jail shortly after. But <laughs> 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 I can't think of his name, but he had a business down there on Wilshire. <laughs> but he went to jail. No kidding. It's something he did way back with racketeer. Nothing to do with your uh, no. syndicate of a tennis. No, team. he was giving me ten thousand uh, dollars every quarter, every year, and I buy equipment and anything I wanted to buy. And uh, that's okay. And I'm playing this guy for the for the bronze. I won the first game, and he got me fourteen to two. Ooh. And the game is 21, and at that particular day, Arthur Allen was kicking my butt. Oh man! So all of a sudden, I hear this voice. Came from the stands, and it was my brother, man. Oh, wow. But I gave one up just like that. Oh. And I beat that guy 21 to 14. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It ran off 19 on him. It ran him off on him. And the chop, he was scared to death <laughs> of the chop. And Dick said, come get that ham. Don't let that sucker beat you. Wait, what did Dick say? <laughs> come, said, come, come, come get, get this ham. <laughs> and I brought my game out, and I started chopping this guy. beat him to death. That's and this guy won the goal in his, in his class. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what was Lex been on that uh, metal stand? Uh, we, it was great, man. It was great. We were standing up there, and, and and the whole thing, when you come into the arena, is it goes up like that, right? Mm -hmm. 15,000 people average every mm. game. Your mm. name is up on the thing. Your country's on, name mm -hmm. on there. His name, and they escort you around the table to your table. It was all first class, man. Mm. Butterflies, all that. I didn't get none of that. I couldn't hardly wait to get to these cats. 
Yeah. <laughs> so you so you got your bronze medal, yep. and now um, when did you meet? Like, what happens after Sydney? When did you meet President Clinton? I saw a picture of you uh, shaking hands in, with I him. I met him in uh, November of, of 2000. He was on the way out. Mm. I met him in November. He was the first president that had the Paralympics and the Olympics come together in one banquet. Okay. He's the first one that did that. What'd and you, then, that was in Washington, D.C. What did you say to the president? Anything? Uh, when I come in the room, man, he was standing up there. <laughs> And I said, I want to know about the Oval Room. <laughs> and them guys reached in their pockets to get the guns. And, and Clinton said, we're going to have to talk, me and you. That's what he said to me. I said, show me what the Oval <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. we. <laughs> yeah, you're the best. I asked him, where is that room that you were doing that damage at, man? <laughs> <laughs> I love Norm. Okay. Uh, new favorite person in the world, Norm. Um, how do you get elected to the United States Table Tennis Hall of Fame? And for those that are watching on YouTube, you'll notice that here at the coffee company, um, there's a, a, the plaque uh, that commemorates Norm being in the Hall of Fame for the United States Table Tennis. Um, is, is sits here, and this is, in effect, your table that we're doing this interview at. And, and how, how did that come about, the uh, Hall of Fame? Uh, after I had quit playing, I got a phone call from my coach. And he told me that I had just been elected on the first round, unanimous, to go into the Hall of Fame. And he wanted to know, could I come to Vegas? I said, yeah, I can come to Vegas. <laughs> and that was in uh, 70, uh, 1918. 2018. 2018. Yeah. And I went down there, and a lot of the people in the pool, a lot of them ladies came down there. Mm. They bought their tickets, went down there, and they had a big banquet. They had a dinner and all that. And my son was the one that introduced me down there. That's got to be a proud moment for you. Right? Got to be real proud. And you get introduced, and you're in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I would like to uh, officially, um, no ballot needed, we're going to put you in a, the Sports Stories Hall of Fame. But my, my, my show, I just made it up right oh, here. you just made it up? Yep. I'm so inspired by you that I just made it up put you in our Hall of Fame. <laughs> I was the only guy that seemed like that was having any fun, man. These guys <laughs> wanted to fight, mad. <laughs> they get all upset at their teammates and all that kind of stuff. I had to stop all of that kind of stuff on our own team. They had this couple guys that didn't like each other and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And this one guy in the wheelchair, he says to me, old man, how can you have a higher rating than me? <laughs> what did he say to me? I said, you're in a wheelchair, man. He said, I can beat you. I said, how do you figure you can beat me? And so one day they went to lunch, and I didn't go – and he didn't go. I said, they got a table over here. Nobody in here now. I don't want you to get in bed. Let's me and you get on this table. I got the guy 15 to 1. I stopped the game, and I'm talking stuff, too. I said, now, who got the one? Wait a minute. I'm confused. Who got And I'm talking. And so I beat him to death. He never said that again. Yeah. I said, how do you think you're going to beat me? You can't get around, dude. You, 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 still, uh, you still chip away at all? Oh, yeah. I go down to the park. Sometimes I don't play. I just watch. Mm -hmm. But uh, lately I get up there and I at least hit, hit for about 30 minutes with them guys. Then when they run their mouth, I go ahead and <laughs> I, I, I dust a couple of them. <laughs> I, um, well, uh, I, it's, it's been my fortune to, to uh, strike up a relationship with you and get an opportunity to know you. And one of the reasons I did, Norm, was because I noticed um, people seem to gravitate towards you. Because, uh, you know, for listeners that are listening right now, there's um, the pool area over at the YMCA, and there's there's one pool where I, I would warm up, and, and I'd work out next to you. And I was always impressed that you're getting your workouts. You're very consistent. But also the uh, community you brought around you. You um, you know, interacted with everybody, made everybody feel better. And uh, that always impressed me about you. And uh, I'm glad I know you. Well, that was like my second family at the Y. Mm -hmm. I came down there and recommended by the doctor to try the heated pool mm -hmm. and exercise. So I went down there, and I didn't join. I just took out that, that uh, temporary thing that you mm -hmm. take out, and I wanted to try it out. I tried it out about two months before I went to Australia. Mm. And I noticed that my game, I was a little quicker mm. by doing this. So when I came back, I couldn't hardly wait to join. That's how I got into that. That's great. And if you stop doing that for about even just two weeks, you see the difference. 
Yeah. That's why old people do what they do. They don't exercise consistently. You got to keep it going. Even if it's just in the water doing that, that's all. That's enough. Mm-hmm. That's enough. Yeah. But absolutely. all them years we've been seeing each other, he never knew nothing about me. <laughs> I didn't. I knew. Well, I knew you were a nice guy. Oh. Uh, but you know, and I know you could talk a good game. And then he I didn't up. know you actually played a lot of good games. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I talk a lot of stuff. I didn't talk. I wasn't the first one to talk, but I talked more than anybody else. Though. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. So Norm, I'm glad we know each other, and thank you for being on the show. This has been our pleasure. You, you've been, you've been, uh, you're my number one guest now. You just Thanks, moved Norm. into first place. Gold medal. I appreciate it. I was glad to do it, man. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is supported by the AAU. Find a local event and join at aausports.org. And remember, you can catch your favorite amateur sports live stream, replays, and highlights at ballertv.com. Sports Stories, along with East Bay, supports the Heroes Movement, a nonprofit that bridges the gap from mental or physical therapy to getting strong again through strength and conditioning workouts. This free service is available for any veteran of the United States Armed Forces. Visit heroesmovementusa.org for more information. Sports Stories, along with thousands of people across the country, also supports the My Stuff Bags Foundation, a nonprofit that provides traumatized children with new belongings and new hope. Learn more at mystuffbags.org. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is a production of Sports Stories, Inc. and is available on Apple Podcasts and YouTube or wherever you listen and watch. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and give us a review. It really helps spread the word. You can find all our social media links, archives, and other info on our website at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Special thanks to the John R. Wooden Course and Wooden's Wisdom. Original music for Sports Stories is courtesy of Lennon Music Productions. Original images by Sienna Lennon Photography. Sports Stories is produced by Christine Jimbo and Marley Rice. Sports Stories is edited by Bob McCall. Additional staff include Ray Castro, Teresa Dolan, Jake Downey, Carlos Haro, and Buck Magic Lennon. I've been running down the road trying to loosen my little got sports stories on my mind. Looking for the look, it might be on Facebook. It's not hard to find sports stories with Danny. Come and watch it with me and take it easy. Come and watch on YouTube. It starts at 5 o'clock. If there's any chance to talk, it's with Sports Stories. See you next week. Whoa! Check it out, Blake!